Hey, it's Pastor Alan Brumback. I just want to thank you for watching here at Central Church. And we pray that God uses His Word to help bless you to be a follower of Christ. You know, here at Central, we are all about making disciples. And we want to do it in a way that really impacts people here locally. And if you are watching from some other location, we want to encourage you to go and be plugged in to a local church where you are. We're so honored to have you. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to have you at Central. Always remember, you're loved at Central. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 30 this morning. And as you are flipping there, I wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of background of where we're at. So we're doing a series called Day Traders and investing into the kingdom and talking about how Christ has called us as Christians to invest in his kingdom. And what does that look like? We talked about investing in your family, investing in the community. And Pastor Ethan brought a great message last week about investing in discipleship. And today I have the privilege of getting to talk about investing investing in rest, investing in resting, invest in rest. And, and what does that look like? You know, so just to give you a couple examples, while I was kind of looking up some, some things to kind of look at here, uh, I found some statistics that I found were pretty interesting. I think that you probably find that as well, uh, the same as I did. In 1910, the average person slept nine hours per night. Could you imagine? In 1910, the average person, average, would sleep nine hours a night. Fast forward to 2018, uh, only two years ago, Americans averaged six, six and a half hours of sleep per night. Roughly 20% of Americans have a sleeping disorder, and 97% of teenagers get less than the recommended amount of sleep. A lot of that probably their own doing, their own doing right? But what we see is that we are people who are desperate for rest, Right? We're desperately searching and seeking this rest. But you know what's interesting, though, is that we're also really bad at it, right? We're, we're desperate for rest, but we're also terrible at resting. Because if left to our own devices, our natural gravitational pull is away from rest. You know, if anybody in this room, uh, maybe you've noticed the same thing that I've noticed, is how we are all desperate for rest. And a great example of this is those of you who are working full time, especially those of you who've been working full time for a long time, there is one day in the future that you cannot wait for, and it is your retirement, right? That's like the day that we look for. It's, it's the day that we retire. And it's so funny, though, because we look, we work our entire lives waiting for the day where we don't have to work anymore. You know, my dad told me when I was in high school and all my friends had money to go do things because uh, they had jobs, but I didn't understand how they got that money. So I was just like, that looks nice. Uh, you know, and, and I was like, I want to get a job. And my dad told me, he said, be careful because once you start working, you never stop, Right? And what we're talking about today is we're talking about what is it when we talk about investing in rest? What does it look like? You know, countless self-help books and podcasts and reams of paper have been written and recorded trying to help men and women find this elusive rest and contentment and peace that we're all striving for. Right, we're all striving for this rest. And some of you maybe right now, you're like listening with enthusiasm and excitement, saying, you know what? Yeah, he's going to tell me everything I want to know. And I'll tell you, yes, I'm going to tell you how you can find rest. But I will tell you that it's probably not going to be in the way that you think. Probably not going to be in the way that you think. Because when we read scripture, we need to be very careful not to take not to take our paintbrush of what we want and paint it over what Christ says. We want to listen to what, and we want to study the word to find what it is that Christ is trying to tell us. So if you have your Bibles, we are in Matthew 11, and we will start reading in verse 28. It says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you just join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the fact that we can come to you, God, that we can study your word, and Father, in it we can find what you are trying to tell us. And God, I ask that as we read the words of Christ this morning, that God, that you would give us hearts that are receptive, eyes to see, ears to hear uh, what it is that you would have us to know this morning. God, I ask that you would speak through me, and as people leave, they would not think anything of me, but they would think greatly of you. 
God, I thank you and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So what we're going to do over the next 30 minutes and 14 seconds is I'm going to look, I'm going to go through and help us understand what is it that Jesus understands rest to be? What is rest in the eyes of Christ? And what we're going to walk away with is this truth, is that true and ultimate rest is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. True and ultimate rest is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to, these passages that we just read, is there's, it kind of, you can break it up into a few things. Is the what, first thing we're going to look at, though, is the invitation. The invitation of Christ. And the first part of this invitation is the offer, right? Come to me and I will give you rest. Notice the beautiful simplicity of our Savior. You know, he doesn't say, come to me, and, and then I'll provide to you uh, a, a certain way that you can find rest. What does he say? He says, come to me. I love what John Bloom says in his article. He says, he doesn't offer us fourfold path to peace, giving enlightenment like Buddha. He doesn't give us five pillars of peace through submission as Islam does, nor does he give us ten ways to relieve your weariness, which we pragmatic, self-help oriented, 21st century Americans are so drawn to. Unique to anyone else in human history, Jesus simply offers himself as the universal solution to all that burdens us. It's an incredibly important thing for us to understand what Jesus says with these three words. Come to me. Come to me. And as much as we would never admit it, right? We would never want to admit this, but it's so true that we as people are so prone to go to everything other than Jesus to find rest. Or what we do is we go to Jesus, we run to Jesus, hopefully thinking that he's going to actually take us where we really want to go. Right? So what we do is we run to Jesus kind of like a hurried businessman runs for a cab in New York City. Just to get him to where he needs to be. And all throughout the history of the church, you'll understand and you'll see that false teachings and heresies have been grounded in this one thing. Taking byproducts of the gospel and byproducts of a new life in Christ and making them the ultimate things. So now the gospel is no more than a means in which we attain these things that we really want. Right? That now the gospel is not just the gospel and its beauty. What it is, is it's now an avenue that we go through to get the things we really desire. You need to know this that Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the means and he is the end. Jesus is not your taxi driver that takes you where you want to go. And to far too many Christians, that is exactly what we have reduced him to. And if we're honest, a lot of us were prone to come to Jesus for what he can give us rather than coming to Jesus for Jesus. And when we flip those two things, we find the bedrock of false teaching that has crippled churches and Christians and people for centuries. There's far too many quote unquote Christians and preachers that will do this. They'll take our desires and your desires and elevate them to the ultimate goal of a relationship with Christ. And if you know your word, you know that that is the furthest thing from the truth. Many people believe that Satan attacks the church from the outside and at many times he can. But I will say that I fully believe that the most assaults on the true gospel of Christ are coming from pulpits and churches across America. Where we get this flipped. And some of you are like, what in the world does this have to do with rest? Right? This doesn't sound like a very restful sermon. I will tell you, it has everything to do with rest. Everything. Because when Jesus says, come to me, we need to know what is it that he is inviting us to? What is it that he is inviting us to? And if your goal of today is just to walk away and be like, how am I going to be able to rest on Monday? Then you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. Jesus does not say, if you want rest, come follow me. He doesn't say, follow me and I'll take you to where you want to be. He simply says, come to me. Come to me. We cannot overcomplicate this. Just come to me. And don't get it twisted that the thing that makes the gospel so sweet is Jesus. Jesus is what makes the gospel sweet. And some of you may be thinking, you know, I don't look at Jesus as a means to an end. And maybe, you know what, you're right. But I want you to know, I want you to think about this. If I were to ask you, what is it that you look forward to the most about heaven? How long would I have to wait until you mention Jesus? How long? How long would I have to wait until you mentioned Christ? It's a good barometer. 
What does Paul say when he, when he wrote to the church in Corinth? What does he say? Is he says that I did not come to you with words of wisdom and flattery. I came and what? I preached Christ crucified. Preached Christ. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. And some of you are probably thinking, you know, I've, I've come to Jesus. Maybe you're thinking like, Pastor Mike, I've come to Jesus. I've repented of my sins and, and you know, I still don't feel any rest. I feel stressed and restless and I maybe felt this when I was first saved, but somehow, some, some way, it's just gone away from me. Or maybe you're even thinking, are you saying that like, I've never come to Jesus? Like if I'm stressed and I'm not feeling restful, are you saying that I'm not saved? And I want you to know this is very, very important that we should never judge our salvation or our standing before God based on how we feel. Never. We do not judge how we are before God based on our feelings. But you need to know this. If you are a Christian, you need to know what it is that the Holy Spirit inside you longs for more than anything else. What is it that the Holy Spirit within you longs for? See, a, a sign that you have truly come to Jesus is that you yearn to continue to come to him. A sign that you've truly come to Christ is that you yearn and desire to continue to come to him. And you grow in that. See, rest is only found in Jesus. He says, come to me. Rest is found only in Jesus, which means this. It's very important. That if in your pursuit for rest, you feel led to rest from Jesus, or to rest from church, or to rest from prayer, or to rest from studying your word, then you either do not know what rest is, or you do not know what a relationship with Jesus is. I will say that, I'll say that again. Because I don't know if we really fully understood it, okay? If in your pursuit for rest, you feel led to rest from Jesus, or rest from the church, or rest from prayer, or rest from studying your word, you greatly are misunderstanding what we mean by rest, or you're greatly misunderstanding what a relationship with Christ looks like. Now we need to know this, that we do not do these things so that we can have a relationship with Christ, right? We do not do these things for that purpose, but we do these things because since we have a relationship with Christ, we know that it is only through these things that we will be freed from the anxieties that burden us. It is only through these things. Why? Because that is what the Holy Spirit within you longs for and craves. Psalm 119, 15. Let's look through scripture. I will meditate on your precepts and I will fix my eyes on your ways. Psalm 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Matthew 6, 33. Excuse me, 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And John 4, 32 through 34, which is a beautiful statement that Christ gives. He says, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Even Jesus, the son of God, fully God, incarnate in the flesh, was fueled by accomplishing the will of his father. And I am amazed at how many Christians live their lives filled with stress and anxiety and restlessness and they cry out for freedom from this burden and they still reject, the first, the, they forsake the gathering of the church, their Bible collects dust in the corner and their prayer life is non-existent. Do you want to know why you are stressed and anxious and you are restless? That is why, that is why scripture is clear that to the Christian, there is nothing sweeter than immersing yourself in God's word. There is nothing sweeter than communing with God in prayer. And there is nothing sweeter than surrounding yourself with the community of like-minded believers in the local church. The beach will not do that for you. Disney will not do that for you. Will we struggle to do these things? Of course. Right? If there's anything that I have said, and I'm going to say this morning, that convicts me the most, it's what I have just said. Will we struggle? Of course we will. Why? Because we're sinful people. Right? No one is perfect. No, not one. We are sinful and we fall short. And we need to know that in our sinful state, our natural gravitational pull is away from these things. However, 
Something beautiful happens when a child runs to the arms of their father. A part of this invitation, we see the offer, but then we see the audience. Who is it that Jesus is inviting to come to him? He says, all who labor and are heavy laden. What does that mean? What does that mean? I think it's very important that we dive into the meaning of that phrase. Why? Because this is the group of people that Jesus is inviting. And I have a question. Have you ever gone somewhere that you weren't invited? You ever been to a party where you weren't invited? Or I don't know about you, but for me, like there's some things that like somebody is hosting a party and somebody that has been invited invites you and you're like, I don't want to go because like so-and-so didn't invite me and that's going to make you look bad. It's going to make me feel awkward and I'm just not going to go, right? So what we're talking about is, hey, does all who labor and are heavy laden, am I in that group? Because this is who he is inviting. Jesus does not invite those who are not heavy laden and burdened. Notice that. This is who he is inviting. So we need to make, take a lot of care in understanding who is this group. What are they laboring for? What is it that burdens them? Well, we kind of read some context. If you go back, and this is, there's so much in this passage that I don't have the time to dive into as much as I would like. But earlier in chapter 11... Jesus says, and he, he condemns these three cities, Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. Matthew eleven twenty 20 says, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So what you see is that Jesus, about 70% of Jesus' ministry took place in the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, a small section of the world. And he invested his time into this, into this place. And most of his miracles, most of his teachings were performed in these cities. And what happens is, is that these people witnessed firsthand the healing, teaching ministry of Christ. And they still did not accept him and they did not repent. So what does Christ do? Is he condemns these cities. Then he goes on in verse 25. He says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Well, what does he mean by these things? What are these things? And based off the context, what we can understand that these things means it refers to is a knowledge of God, a knowledge of who Christ is, the son of God, the savior of the world, and the only hope for salvation. So when we understand that that's what he's saying, when we say these things then we are led to ask this next question. What does it mean when God hides these things from the wise and reveals them to little children? Like, is God hiding salvation from people? I know that doesn't seem very nice. And here's the thing we need to understand. We're gonna, I'm going to explain that. But first, we need to know this, that God is 100% sovereign in salvation. You do not save people. I do not save people. It is the Holy Spirit of God that saves people. Amen. Revelation 7.10, salvation belongs to our God. However, the reason that people reject God is not because God has made them do so. The, peop the reason people reject God is because they do not want to know him. And this is beautifully illustrated in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we'll start in verses 18 through 19. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Notice that God is not hiding from people. God has not hidden himself from men. However, God is hidden from men because in their sinfulness, men reject the truth of God which he has plainly revealed to them. He has plainly revealed to them. And notice, go on in verse 22 in Romans. What does he say? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And who is it that Jesus mentions in Matthew 11 are the ones where these things are hidden from? The wise and understanding. See, men do not know God because men do not want God. Again, what does this have to do with rest? It has everything to do with rest because the reason that the world around us is so restless, the reason that people lack so much peace is because they refuse to come to the only one who can free them from the thing that burdens them. They refuse. So what does the man do in this burdened state? 
We see people all around us who are burdened and what has been revealed to them, they willingly reject. Scripture says, in their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. So what does man do in this burdened state? Romans 1, 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up. Keep going a little bit further. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice that the thing that the man does in his burdened state is that he worships. He worships. He does not stop worshiping. He simply chooses to worship something else. He simply chooses to worship something else. And then the question is, why do they do this? Is because people choose to find their comfort in the worship of something else. This is something that you and I need to know. This is something that is critically true to both the Christian and the non-Christian, that a man will seek rest in whatever that man worships. I'll say that again. A man will seek rest in whatever that man worships. Why? Because internally we know that the burden we carry is a burden that is not on our hands, but rather it is a burden that is on our hearts. There is no greater burden than the one that is carried by the one who rejects God. Think about it. There is no greater burden than the burden that is carried by somebody who rejects God. And that is not something that we should lord over people. This is something that should break our hearts. That the only thing that could free them from what is enslaving them is the one that they refuse to go to. All people desire rest from the burden on their souls, yet they willingly reject what God has plainly revealed. Therefore, what is it that they are laboring for? They labor for salvation from their burden. They are burdened by the fact that they cannot attain it. And the world around us is desperately seeking salvation through their worship. I'll give you an example. The world around us, what? we worship self-image. Why? Because we seek rest in the approval of other people. We worship politics because we believe that our political affiliation will bring the rest and the solutions to all of our weariness. We worship ourselves because we think that down deep within us, we have what we need to find ultimate rest. Ultimately, there is a burden that all men carry, and it is the burden of their sinfulness before an almighty God. And this is what we feel. If you're not a Christian, this is the burden that weighs you down. And this is why you seek everything you can to free you from it. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And that is the audience that Jesus is speaking to. That is who the invitation is for. Those who are burdened and heavy laden by the sin debt they owe before an almighty God. Amen. This is the rest that Jesus offers. It's further driven home by the fact that in verse 29, he goes on, and he goes, and you will find rest for what? Your hands? What does he say? You will find rest for your souls. Does Christ bring rest to our hands? Absolutely he can. Does Christ bring rest to our anxieties? 100%. 1 Peter 5.17, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. But before all of that, you and I need to know that our God is a saving God. He is a saving God. Psalm 68.20, our God is a God of salvation. And when Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, think of what that means to the person who is burdened by their sin. Think of what that means. Think of the joy that that would bring. Now, for instance, if I was to come up and I had some keys in my hand, and I just rattled these keys in front of the microphone, that probably wouldn't bring much joy to your heart, right? You'd probably be like, that's really annoying, and I'd rather you stop. But if you were locked in a dungeon, sentenced to death within the next 24 hours, and you heard the jingling of keys, think of the joy that would leap from within you. Think of the joy that would come from within you. Think of what that sound means to you. And it is the same way when Christ extends this invitation of rest to those who are heavy laden and are burdened and are laboring. This is why the wise and the arrogant do not see their need. Rather, it is those with childlike faith. 
It is those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It is those who are poor in spirit who will inherit the kingdom of God, Matthew 5. And as long as people see themselves as well, they will not run to Christ. What does Jesus say in Luke 5, 31 and 32? It says, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So who is it that labors and is heavy laden? All people labor for rest and carry the heavy burden of their sin. Christ openly invites all who need him. And here's the beauty of a relationship with Jesus. If you want him, you can have him. Isn't that amazing? That Christ rejects no one. No one comes to Christ and God say, no, you're not good enough. If you want him, you can have him. It's not the wise and the understanding, the ones that got it all figured out, the ones who figured out how they're going to deal with their issues. It's those who come to Christ and throw themselves at his feet and say, I have nothing. I have nothing. Then we see the response. We see the invitation. Invitation, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. But then we see the response. Verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'll go back and I'll read verse 28. It says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We see Jesus offer rest, but then he also says what this looks like. What does it look like to come to Jesus? Based on the context, we know he's saying, believe in me. These people reject me, but if you want freedom from your burden, believe in me. Come to me. Believe in me. And what this looks like is what he says, taking my yoke upon you and learning from me. And some of us are probably like, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. Right? Jesus is offering rest, but then he says, take my yoke. And some of us are like, what does that mean? Like, is he talking like egg yolk? Like, I don't know. And I'm going to, so um, there's going to be a picture on the screen of this is what he means with this, a yoke. Okay. A yoke is a, it's a wooden cross piece that is used to attach two beasts of burden, right? An ox or a donkey or whatever it is. So you put your, their head through those, those little loops on the sides. What happens is that they are burdened by this weight, and now they are pulling something, and they're typically plowing fields, right? That is a yoke. So when Jesus says, take my yoke, that is what he's saying. That's what he's referring to. And some of us are like, whoa, 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 okay. I was with you. You're like, Mike, I was with you until you said that he's going to give me a yoke. Like, that doesn't seem like rest to me. Like, that doesn't seem very restful. Am I simply just exchanging one burden for another? And I will tell you, that is 100% what you are doing. You are exchanging your burden for his Am I simply just exchanging one yoke for another? That is what you are doing. You are taking your yoke and Christ is taking your yoke from you and giving you his. Now, if that doesn't bring rest to your soul right there, then we need to understand what is the difference between your yoke and his. What is the yoke of Jesus? Matthew eleven thirty. 30, what does he say? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is his burden? What is the work? John 6 29, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That is the yoke of Christ. But then we see the yoke of sin. We spent a lot of time already talking about the yoke of sin and the burden of our sin, but let's kind of just a few verses. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Isaiah 53, five and six. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is your yoke? Death and the wrath of God. That is the burden that we carry apart from Christ. Why? One sin and against an eternal God receives an eternal punishment. And the reason it takes you and I eternity in hell to pay that is because it is against an eternal God and we are not eternal. But the beauty of Christ is that where our limits begin, he continues. We serve a limitless God because what it would take you and I eternity to pay off, Christ paid in a moment. When on the cross, he bore the burden of God's wrath against your sin on himself. What is your yoke? Death and the wrath of God. What is the yoke of Christ? Believing and abiding. Believing and abiding. Trusting in him and not in yourself. You see, what we have here is a yoke exchange. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus took the yoke of our sin debt upon himself. That yoke that is burdening you, that holds you down, Christ took it off of you and put it on himself. And here's the beauty, is that he didn't just take the yoke from you, but he demolished it. What does scripture say? That he has separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. He's taken our transgressions, thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. Do you know that when you stand before God as a Christian, you stand before him righteous and redeemed and perfect? That should deserve a clap or something. Don't do it now. That's a pity clap. <laughs> if that doesn't bring rest, you don't understand the burden. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Think about that. The one thing that Jesus did not know is sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. He took yours and gave you his. Jesus took the punishment that I deserve so that I could have the reward that he deserves. You see, you and I are saved by works, but it's not our own. We are saved by the work of Jesus on our behalf, doing what we could never do. And when we come to Jesus, we die to that old yoke. We die to that old yoke. You know, September 27th, in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate baptism. In baptism, what, we, what we're really doing is, is the, think of the symbolism there. Going under the water, dying to your old self, dying to that old burden, and coming up new, raised to walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Let me read that again. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Hey, this is Pastor Allen again. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, uh, being uh, online is great. Watching services online is awesome. But there's no substitute for being involved in a local church. So I want to pray that you will be involved in a local church. And if you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Central. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.